Hi. Uh, so this is a sort of a grandiose title. It's a bit of a clickbait. But uh, this is about why running remote code execution as a service, which we do at Udemy, is a bad thing to do. And doing it safely and making sure we have decent cost controls in place uh, uh, is the reason we built this prototype and experiment. I wanted to run through what we built and the results that we've had so far. So a bit about me. I, I've come from a heavy infrastructure background. I've worked on OpenStack, Kubernetes. I worked through various companies running operations teams. And then I decided to take a sharp left and went into the world of pure software. Um, but I couldn't resist going back to doing infrastructure work when this came up. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm not sure how many people know Udemy. Um, it's a people. Most people know it as a consumer as a consumer marketplace where you can go buy uh, courses, uh, video courses, or as a lot of the time, everything is on sale nearly all the time. Uh, so people know us from the sales and the advertisements. But we also have a fairly big business side, where we take a lot of the best content and sell it to businesses. This is going to sound like a sales pitch. I'm not that person. This is just important context for the rest of what we're going to talk about. Um, we lear we er learned early on that just consuming video and reading text isn't a great way for people to learn all skills, and that hands-on learning is really, really important. So for part of that, we have labs. So most people will be exposed to these, even in the marketplaces. We have in throughout a lot of the technical courses, we have coding exercises, so this is a very, very simple one on the Intro to Python course. Um, but we have, this, is a, this runs a real Docker container. Um, every time somebody does a coding exercise, uh, we spin up a Kubernetes job, run the container, run the tests, and re reply with the, if it was good or bad. Um, so that was the start of our hands-on learning. Um, as we progressed, we started running labs inside of Kubernetes that were longer running. So traditionally, like a coding exercise will take five seconds to run at, at the outside. But we wanted to build more in-depth experiences. So how to build an entire Flask application isn't really something you can do in a coding exercise. But having a real web-based IDE and a f file system and running a real Docker container is something we, you, we can do and uh, instructors can teach uh, practical skills. And then, because once you do one thing, uh, people, people have all these great ideas, we needed to start building uh, full VM-based labs because I don't know if anyone's tried running Docker inside of, or running Kubernetes inside of Kubernetes natively. It's not a great experience. Uh, so we went one better, we built a VM that runs inside of Kubernetes that you build Kubernetes in um, because inception, uh, for anyone who was around in the OpenStack days, triple O was a heavy inspiration. Um, but one of the big requests we've had is real cloud labs. So we support companies giving their employees access to like a real cloud environment. So a real AWS account or a real Azure account, Google coming soon, um, that, you, that their employees can actually log into the console and, and play around with. So the, these, this obviously presents a fairly big security risk because these are accounts that are financially controlled by us, not the companies. So for B2B, it is not as big a deal. Um, but we wanted to expand the reach of this. So what we do is we provision ephemeral. They're not really ephemeral because if anyone's worked with any of the account provisioning APIs and any of the major cloud providers, they don't work very well. Uh, so they, we have a pool. They get used, they get cleaned, they get recycled. Uh, but for, for this use case, we can consider, consider them ephemeral. Um, the problem was we wanted to expose this on the marketplace side, so to completely untrusted users, uh, actually to people who were signing up for a free trial, so they hadn't even get it, given a credit card yet, and uh, we hadn't validated email addresses. So obviously when the product folks 
uh, came to the engineering team and said, we want to do this. We all cried internally for a while. Uh, and then <coughs> said, oh, we can't do this because of all this risk. And then the response was, no, but we want to do it. So we were, what, what can we do to mitigate it? Uh, AWS billing and Azure billing is generally at least eight hours behind. There's a lot of damage somebody could do in eight hours. Um, and even the cost control and AWS budgets, they vary wildly. Some services are pretty quick at reporting into that. Others are eight to 12 hours behind as well. So the way we looked at this, well, the way I looked at this, I came from doing infrastructure and we did a lot of work in IoT in Azure. And the con there's a concept of a digital twin. So it's a electronic representation of something in the real world. Uh, this is the digital twin for my plug on my espresso machine in my kitchen. Uh, because it's very important for me to have the espresso machine warmed up by the time I get downstairs. So this is a, a, a piece of JSON that sits in MQTT. Uh, it reports the status from the plug. So if somebody turns it off with the plug, or uh, and also reports how much power it's currently taking. So I can I know that the machine's finished warming up because it stopped drawing all the power. Um, but I can also control th th this from the digital side by my phone or by talking to Google. Um, so I w when we were looking at this problem, we thought maybe we could fix it by trying to build digital twins of cloud resources uh, in Kubernetes because everything is a Kubernetes shape hole these days. So this was the initial design proposal. Um, we decided to try and build everything off of CloudTrail and Azure Audit log events. So every time you interact with AWS, we have a, an event that goes into an S3 bucket. It's not instant, it's about 50 minute latency generally. It's a hell of a lot better than eight hours, um, which will give us a bit of a heads up if somebody was deciding to crypto mine by booting all the machines. Um, for the, I'm not sure, if, are people familiar with the Kubernetes reconciliation loop and the concept of objects being owned by other objects? So we decided to try and abuse that to attach a cloud resource to a cloud account to a lab. So we, every time we updated the cloud resource with its current cost, or if we added a new cloud resource, it would automatically trigger the cloud account to, be re, to regenerate its total cost which would cause the lab to regenerate its total cost. And this, this meant that we could have the digital twin sitting in etcd and querying from the Kubernetes API, and which we could then use things like Gatekeeper or Open Policy Agent, which we already had running for, for other security tooling, to write policies that would remove labs if they started going over a certain threshold. Um, <clears throat> So this is a very basic idea. Um, we would define each of the labs. So just this is just a sample. This, this particular lab has two AWS accounts. One it's scoped to the full account and another one is a VPC. And the time, like we can only run it for 30 minutes but we're gonna let people spend $500. Uh, this isn't something we would ever do but f for the purposes of this, and then every time somebody boots a lab, we, can, we create a lab resource. And it does the reference to what lab definition is based off. And then as that lab gets provisioned, we'll create a cloud account. And then every time we create a cloud resource, we, we, we automatically create uh, one of these based on the cloud trail event. And from this, this is where all of the pretty much logic all, all happens. Um, we can see how much we've already spent on it, how much it's gonna cost if we leave it running to the end, and uh, how much it's costing us per uh, minute, I think. So for this, I'm gonna hope the demo gods are nice. Uh, 
so. So we have the three lab definitions here. I'm going to demo the low cost. So now in so we see this lab is currently running. There's no resources running yet, so there's no uh, cost yet. But we can see that this was when this was provisioned, we went off and provisioned a cloud account with one of our providers. We use a couple of providers for different cloud accounts, and if. We can see in the events, we decided where to schedule it, where, where, to, where to create it, so we created, the, we created the account. Now, so I don't have this hooked up to CloudTrail, um, but this is, the, this is a sort of an example of a resource being created that we would stick into the events. So so now we can see that we created we we started creating a twin and we go into our some resources. So we can see this, this VM is running, and this will update every 30 seconds. And this will attach all the way up to the lab. So then if we need to make sure the As we add more and more resources, we'll see them attach to the various accounts. So if I actually... something I knew I forgot to do, which was drop the cost. So I'm gonna have to create a couple more.
So now we can see that with all of that activity, we reach the max spend and it just deletes it. So what, what overall, overall what we did, I did abuse Kubernetes and how the operator pattern works by effectively here, every time we calculate the status of a cloud resource, we requeue it and tell Kubernetes that I, I don't care what happens, I want you to reevaluate this in your next in a reconciliation loop in 30 seconds. And that triggers the all the way up to the top of the lab. So this was the initial proof of concept. Um, all of the costing was hard coded, all, all of the events weren't pulled in. But we did build we built a tooling that pulls from S3, uh, parses all the events for, from CloudTrail, and builds out resources. Um, then we also built, we had to build tooling that would pull from the AWS cost API, because that changes dramatically depending on what account we're using, so what, what company we're using to provision the account with, um, and what, uh, resources that we're booting, even down to things like the the AMI used. We then had to build. We we didn't we didn't build the tooling to delete the instances yet. This has been running as an experiment to figure out how accurate it is for the last year. Uh, so we we did build tooling to remove timed out labs. So if they if they're over three hours in general, we go and remove the accounts. Um, and we also then built tooling to go download the actual costs from AWS and compare them to what we thought the project the costs were going to be to keep that in, in sync. And then from there, we emitted that data into our data ecosystem because that was an important way to keep the analytics running. Some of the biggest challenges we ran into uh, were around collecting CloudTrail logs is actually harder than it should be. Um, especially when you're across multiple providers and the providers don't necessarily give you a root CloudTrail resource for the, for the root account because they're sharding these accounts across multiple other customers. So us having to spin up a new CloudTrail uh, subscription every time we started a lab and then also making sure that the users couldn't remove that cloud trail, which would be unfortunate if they were able to stop us having insight. Because, as I said before, these aren't really ephemeral. Oh, there, is, there is recycling happening. So making sure that we were trying to keep track of what, what uh, labs were in what account at what time and trying to time bucket the information was more difficult than it should be but uh, trying to make sure that that was a, t a significant time sink for the team. And the 50 minute delay, um, it's uh, the entire time I've talked about this, it's been near real time because real time is basically impossible with the tooling we have. I, didn't, I don't want to give anyone the impression that it's instant. Um, annoyingly, when I worked in Azure, I found out that for, th for, for some of the government contracts like Jedi and Wild and Stormy, they had to provide 15 minute, 15 minute latency billing. So AWS and Azure have this tooling. It's just not turned on for us normal people, which is very unfortunate. Um, but understanding the scale that they're working at, I can see why they want to run, wouldn't want to run that for everybody. Um, pricing models for some of the more complex serverless tooling gets very difficult, especially things like lambdas and API gateway. Uh, not all of those metrics are emitted into CloudTrail or somewhere we can get to try and work out the uh, cost model without having to write some very significant custom code. And a lot of the, consumer, the consumable metrics, things like how much network you're using, 
uh, if you're being overcharged for extra disk I.O. Um, is, is hard to pull out. But overall, we've, we've, we've been running it for over a year with two resources as an experiment. Um, we're, we run with EC2 and RDS. So right now, we, we're picking up the create instance. We're picking up the price rate and updating it. And then as the instance gets quiesced and started again, we're picking up that time, time difference. And if uh, an instant uh, SKU or class gets changed, we're managing to, to pull that data in as well. The limitations of what we have now is we're assuming everything's on demand. Um, pulling out things like RIs and uh, so, uh, the spot instances is more difficult. It is something that's fixable, uh, but for, for our use case, we just wanted to see how accurate we could get before we invested a huge amount of more time into it. Um, we, we're, not, we're not tracking things like network usage. Uh, we're not actually tracking things like Elastic IP attachment either, now that they're billing for that. Um, we, we, it took a little bit of time to figure out how to do uh, the change of class, so changing from one Type, one VM type to another, or changing things like the, the disk IO class, is uh, it took a little bit of time to make sure that we were doing the projected costs correctly, to make sure we weren't wildly, or, uh, wildly under or overestimating. Um, and we, had to, we currently are ignoring adi additional disks, uh, just to, again, because of the complexity to try to pull that data out and map it correctly, but it is something that would be doable. So we've been running since the end of 2022. Uh, there was a period over the summer where we, we wasn't running. Um, so with the sampling that we've done, we've—I would say—we're pretty close um, for a prototype. I, I was really impressed with the work the team did. Um, for whatever reason, we vastly underestimate RDS uh, costs compared to EC2. But at that sample size, it's a pretty good. Uh, collection. Um, so why did we do it in Kubernetes? Um, mainly because I wrote the prototype in Kubernetes because I wanted something really quick that I could write a prototype in to get buy-in within the company. And it, I like the model. I know a lot of people hate the model. It's, but it's something that works in my head, building up uh, reconciliation loops of events and uh, building a system like that. It also allows us in the future to move to, to how, combining a container lab and a cloud lab. Because right now, you have a cloud lab, that's one thing that's separate. Um, but if you want a nice IDE to write Terraform in, that we, we can't use our current IDE that we have for the Kubernetes-based labs on the cloud. So allowing us to combine the two of them this operator actually helps, would help us do that in the long run as well. Um, we were already writing gatekeeper rules, and while OPA is not the easiest thing in the world to get your head around, or open policy agent isn't the easiest thing to understand, we already have people who are writing, them, writing those rules. So having a single place where we could define the set of policies and rules around uh, our lab inf infrastructure was a major advantage. Um, why not Kubernetes? Uh, we are, in Udemy, we're a Kotlin microservices-based environment. The Kotlin infrastructure for Kubernetes operators is nascent. Uh, so things like everything we get from the, the, start, the Golang-based operators, the nice CRD generation, the auto generation of code isn't there. So we had to teach uh, developers how to write raw CRDs, which is not a great experience uh, for most people. Um, we did test this at a reasonably large scale, like a, a couple of thousand uh, accounts and resources, um, which for us will be 
what we we would be looking for. It didn't break ECAS. I would worry if we did bring this into a larger into the marketplace uh, that we the S, the SCD they provision in ECAS might not like the load, but that would be something to worry about. If, if we get that big, I'll be happy. I'll go run an, an etcd somewhere else on my own Kubernetes. Um, it's just weird as well. Uh, like every time I talked about this internally, I, for the first 20 minutes, I got a lot of very confused looking faces looking at me. Uh, again, because this, this was on the software side, not on the infrastructure side. So this was completely foreign concepts to a lot of the developers. And it doesn't fit our standard model. We're uh, gRPC and Kafka uh, with Kotlin microservices. That's how everyone else works. So being the one unique microservice is probably not a good idea. So it'll be a trade-off as we go down the line. For now, we're just leaving it as is. Things have shifted. The, the priority for, for exposing this to the internet is not as high as it used to be. There is substantial work. It took, it took the team a couple of months to get this up and running and reliable against two resource types. And that would mean that every time AWS launches a new product or Azure launches a new product, we either have to restrict it by policy or we have to go and figure out how we can update the tool to, to get the billing for it. Um, this will come back into scope as, as more and more learning is moving online and more and more companies are coming into like the likes of you, tools like Udemy. There's more and more usage, so the security is going to become a higher and higher priority. Um, and then adding support for calculating the cost of our container and VM labs is also something that would, should be added in the long term to figure out if people are trying to abuse the VM and container labs. They are. I've seen some of it where people try to spin up multiple very small containers to do very small amounts of crypto mining. I don't really understand why, um, but it's free compute, so that's probably why. Um, but keeping an eye on that sort of usage tracking. So for us, what we could also use it for in the future, um, right now we're very interested in how how the learning products we, we, we provide to users, how efficient they are at actually getting people to understand the, the, the material. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. It, it, with traditional education, we have assessments and, and uh, tests. A lot of the learners on Udemy are doing things because they're interested in, in it or their manager has told them to learn about Kubernetes. Um, but we don't know how efficient the lab is. Once they boot the lab, we know that they spend an hour and a half on it, but we can't tell really what they've done. So pulling in the events that this lab, in general, after the first five minutes, the, user, the, the, the learner has booted a VM or has created a load balancer would give us a much deeper insight into, like, into how people are using it and how efficient the instructions that have been given, the tooling that the, that the instructor wrote uh, is to getting people to use the lab, which then means we have something we can use to promote the, the more efficient labs towards, towards learners. Um, as part of that is we have tooling for the container-based labs that Gen AI, because everything is Gen AI these days, will give you hints based on this, where you are now and what you need to do. So having a set of, like a, a, a list of the resources that the user has created and what they should have created. There is some useful information coming back from the likes of ChatGPT on that. It's not great, but it's an iterative process. Um, we've had reasonable success with uh, the programming labs giving ChatGPT giving, uh, giving us hints. Um, but that, that would be another place that we could uh, pull this data to use. For, for anyone else, for, I know for, in our production environment, configuration management drift is always a big, big issue. So these sort of, this sort of data could easily import. Uh, you could write a Lambda or something that would import this into Terraform as soon as it's created or 
If you have a tool like SI, you might want to create a node in uh, based off CloudTrail, so it pops up in the beautiful collaborative editor. Um, that's definitely a way forward. Um, and also just the standard alerting that Gra Gra for some reason somebody gave Graham console access with write and he went and created 400 GPU machines and he's now f fleeing the country. <laughs> so um, with that, any questions? Or is it lunacy? Sorry? The, the, the security groups? Oh, yeah, so they, there is some lockdown in the security policy, uh, but for the labs to actually be useful, we need to let people create things. Uh, there's only so far the security policy and all the providers will let us go. Like, we, we turn off things like GPU instances in 99% of cases, and we turn off the very large instances. Um, but it's difficult to try and write security group rules that uh, limit the, like, the number, or if, with Lambda especially, uh, it's real easy for somebody to write a Lambda and then inv have an invocation script that hits it 10,000 times, and none of that will be picked up by the security policies. Um, I considered other solutions, and then this had other potential use cases down the line that we would to do things like provisioning of, of the Kubernetes-based labs and do the combination that, I, that when I was looking at the design, this was an easy way to do both. Um, I kind of knew how Azure had done its 15-minute billing, um, and that's why I based it off CloudTrail in the beginning. And it, it, doing MapReduce or Spark Streaming could also have the similar output, um, but we weren't, that again would have been extra tooling we, did, we would need to bring in to the, that the company wasn't particularly, or our, the engineering department wasn't familiar with. So it was, new, it was net new either way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.